Good morning uh, to everyone joining us here in Washington and good evening to everyone joining us from South Asia. Welcome to our webinar on Pakistan and the current coronavirus. My name is Tamanna Salikuddin. I'm the director for South Asia programs at the US Institute of Peace. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you and remind you that you are joining us via YouTube live and you can leave questions in the comment section and please identify yourself if you are asking a question and are part of the media. So we will um, be taking questions at the end and we welcome you to leave questions throughout the session. Uh, the US Institute of Peace is a national nonpartisan independent institute founded by the US Congress and dedicated to the proposition that a world without violent conflict is possible, practical and essential for US and global security. And the US Institute of Peace is Obviously, as we're all teleworking, we're trying to look at different crises around the world. And it is my pleasure today to have a wonderful panel of guests to discuss the crises in the coronavirus uh, crisis and its impact in Pakistan. In addition to the severe human cost, the COVID-19 crisis has forced Pakistan's already suffering economy to a grinding halt and left many of Pakistan's most vulnerable without income and sustenance. Um, the crisis has also shown uh, where the central and provincial governments are working hard to stem the crisis by enforcing a lockdown um, and having over a seven and a half billion dollar uh, relief package. But the country's response has still laid bare troubling weaknesses in governance, public health and economic stability. Um, so today's panel will hopefully discuss all of these different issues and talk about some of the push and pull uh, currently as we're going into Ramzan in Pakistan, the push and pull between forces on the economic side and also on the public health side. With that, I'd like to turn it to our first panelist, Khurram Hussain. Khurram is the business editor at Dawn Newspaper, the largest and most read English daily in Pakistan. He's based out of Karachi and he uh, writes a very widely read column and actually wrote a great piece just this morning on the coronavirus crisis and its impact. Khurram, please, we'd ask you to open. Thanks, Tamanna. Uh, pleasure to be here. And thanks to Yusuf for the invitation uh, as well. So I'll give an, a brief overview of uh, the journey that Pakistan has traveled since uh, the, the whole COVID crisis began and where things stand as of today. Uh, Pakistan registered its first positive case on February 26th and uh, the first fatality on March 18th. And in between, uh, a raft of measures had already been taken, uh, such as the closure of schools, the postponement of the, uh, the uh, March 23rd parade. Um, so uh, different provincial authorities and the federal government had woken up by at the, even before the first fatality had came in uh, to the fact that uh, the, the arrival of this uh, infection presents a very serious public health challenge and uh, vigorous measures are going to need to be taken uh, for social distancing. Uh, the first lockdowns uh, were announced in, uh, in the government of Sin a few days later by the federal government itself. It's been about a month now uh, since we've been under lockdowns. But since the lockdowns began, uh, it took literally a few days almost uh, for a very powerful counter or a, or a backlash, one can say perhaps, uh, to start building up. Uh, and that backlash has gathered steam ever since. Uh, the backlash was led primarily by your, uh, the business and industrial uh, uh, concerns of the country. Uh, it began by with, with the exporting, uh, the exporter community saying that, well, we have orders in the pipeline and uh, perhaps we should be allowed to reopen just so we can process those orders in the name of bringing in uh, important foreign exchange that is going to be required as the country moves forward. Um, and uh, those debates continued and uh, in piecemeal fashion, different provincial governments began to grant exemptions to uh, specific uh, exporters uh, and exporter groups. Uh, certain essential uh, industries had to be granted exemptions. So edible oils, for example, and, uh, and other foodstuffs uh, had to continue operating. And then of course, the allied industries had to be granted uh, uh, exemptions to be able to keep the, the, the sector of, uh, operational. Um, and little by little, as this story unfolded, uh, what, uh, many other industrial concerns were sucked into it. And uh, the process of consultation that the government opened with these business and industrial elites grew uh, in scope to include uh, just about everybody. 
uh, down the road because everybody started stepping forward, making a claim that they are somehow either an essential industry or that the work that they perform is essential to the economy uh, you, uh, to be able to face the kind of challenges a lockdown is facing, uh, that the lockdown is creating. And uh, over a period of a couple of weeks, we saw the entire narrative change. In fact, within days, we saw the entire narrative change uh, away from this being a public health emergency towards the, the present moment being an economic challenge. And um, uh, it didn't take long before the prime minister himself actually got on to, uh, uh, got on to this. Uh, his own commitment to the lockdowns and to the, um, the framing of the moment as a public health emergency was weak to start off with. Uh, he began by uh, talking about the present moment uh, primarily in economic terms. Um, and to this day, in all his uh, public pronouncements, he continues to say that more than the virus itself, the greater danger that uh, Pakistan faces is from unemployment, is from hunger, and is from providing for the sustenance of the daily wages and, uh, and, and the poor. Uh, this is, of course, in stark contrast to the advice that is coming from the public health professionals, from certain uh, uh, members of the provincial government, such as the government of Sindh. Uh, who want the, the entire crisis to be framed as primarily as a public health emergency. Uh, and that's where we stand today. Uh, we stand where the uh, federal government has, as of, uh, as of uh, a few days ago, um, sat down with the, the ulema, the, the religious establishment of the country, with the approach of uh, the, the holy month of fasting, um, who have added their voice to being uh, to, to, to saying that mosques and other religious uh, congregations should be allowed to reopen uh, in the holy month, and uh, the government caved in uh, to that uh, pressure, uh, announcing a 20-point uh, uh, plan to uh, maintain social distancing in mosques, uh, but uh, permitting them to reopen. And uh, of course, now the one by one, we are seeing the medical fraternity step forward. So uh, yesterday, for example, uh, a group of doctors representing the two largest medical uh, associations in the country uh, gave a very emotional press conference at the Karachi Press Club, uh, urging the, the government to withdraw its uh, order to reopen mosques during the holy month of fasting uh, and urging them to see the whole uh, affair as a public health emergency and listen first and foremost to the advice being proffered by doctors and second, to the advice being proffered by business industrial elites or by the religious establishment. Uh, today, they were followed up by another press conference held by doctors in Lahore um, who have uh, echoed and reiterated the same message. Uh, so now um, the, the holy month of fasting is set to begin in a, in a few days. Um, and uh, uh, that's where the country stands uh, to open or not to open. Uh, for the time being, the government is quite set uh, on its uh, intention uh, one of the other very senior ministers of the government was on the air yesterday when he was asked about this uh, decision to reopen mosques. And he actually took the line that uh, Pakistan does not have the enforcement capacity that many other advanced industrial countries do, like Australia. And he gave the example of countries like Australia and the United States. And he pointed to the protests that are gathering steam in the United States against the lockdown, saying that, look, even in America, they're having a hard time enforcing these lockdowns. Uh, here in Pakistan, our enforcement capacity is even weaker. And uh, as a result, we don't have the wherewithal. We don't have the state capacity to be able to, uh, to take on the religious establishment on the streets and uh, force uh, a lockdown in this country. So we have no choice but to seek a negotiated path out with them. Um, and uh, so now we're seeing uh, impassioned appeals coming from the medical fraternity. And as the holy month begins, uh, we'll wait to see uh, where the infection goes. Uh, and, uh, and how things play out. Uh, just to conclude, I, sh I can point out that uh, the situation right now is that uh, Pakistan, it took about one month for Pakistan to register its first 50 fatalities in, um, uh, uh, due to the, the, the virus. Um, the last 50 uh, were registered in the previous three days. So between the 18th and the 21st, we had 50 fatalities, whereas the first 50 took a month uh, to, to, to come in. Uh, so already we are well on our way uh, towards exponential growth. And the prime minister himself, in the same announcement in which he said that we are going to be reopening mosques, also said that by May, their own projections are showing uh, that we will be into, uh, we, Pakistan will be facing up to 50,000 uh, positive cases, uh, a figure that right now stands at 10,000. Uh, so, you know, even the government is, is seeing a very sharp 
uh, uptick in, uh, in, in, in the number of cases coming. And the doctors are trying to argue that this is the wrong time to start loosening the, the lockdown, to start opening the country up. Uh, but that's the state of play in the policy debate at the moment, uh, on the very eve of the holy month of past. Thanks very much, Karam. Um, thank you for talking to us a little bit about how the lockdown is actually starting to unravel in Pakistan. And hopefully we'll, in the question and answer, you can uh, talk a little bit more about that. I'd like to move now to Uzair Yunus, who until recently was director of South Asia practice at Albright Stonebridge. And in this role, he helped develop client strategies for long-term growth across South Asia. He has written regularly on South and Central Asian politics, trade and economics in various publications. Uzair, we'd love to hear from you about the economic impact of the coronavirus in Pakistan. It couldn't have come at a worse time for Pakistan, which was already fragile coming out of an IMF program. Um, please, I'd love to hear more about the economic impact, both at a national level, but also in the provinces. Thank you. Thank you, Tamanna, and thanks for inviting me to this discussion. I think um, just to put it, things in perspective, let me begin by just saying that what's going on in South Asia, I mean, one could argue around the world, but particularly focusing on South Asia, the series of events unfolding due to this pandemic are perhaps the most uh, uh, critical series of events that have faced the region as a form of a crisis since partition. Um, and I think we need to recognize that, whether it's in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, or elsewhere. Um, and so the impact of that, both in terms of social upheaval and economic upheaval is immense. Um, for Pakistan, this, as you said, couldn't have come at a worse time. The country was only just beginning to stabilize following uh, the implementation of yet another IMF program. And if you look at the economy uh, or the economic trajectory of Pakistan over the last three decades or so, it's always been on the brink. Um, and every few years we see growth uh, tick up to four, four and a half percent, and then the IMF has to step in because the country faces an external crisis. In this situation, the impact on the external side uh, on the macro economy is, is, is huge and will have big, uh, uh, you know, will have long lasting impact. One, on one side, you see remittance flows, uh, which come in uh, every year to the tune of about $10 billion just from the Gulf countries alone. So uh, will dry up and they will dry up for a long time because of what's happening in the oil markets and, and the upheaval we're seeing uh, between the war of uh, market share between Russia and Saudi Arabia. On the other side, on the export side, which is the main markets are the European Union and the United States for textiles in particular, um, those economies will uh, slow down and will go into negative growth for a long time to come. So Pakistan will not find export markets over there. So on, on that front, you will see while a lower oil price will ease up some of the issues uh, related to Pakistan's external sector and a decline in import will happen because the economy is slowing down, uh, you will see an issue related to a decline in foreign exchange flows at the same time. And that points to some of the uh, points Kodra made around exporters coming up and saying, let us stay open because uh, we, we need a foreign exchange coming into the country. But then one could argue that if there is no market for you to sell to, why you want to keep it open in the first place and who's going to pay for all this product because no one is buying right now. You just look at what's happening in Bangladesh. Um, I think at the micro level uh, across the country, um, on the remittance side, the big impact that I think not people aren't talking about and focusing on is the impact on KP, the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, where a lot of excess labor goes into Saudi Arabia as blue collar wage earners and send a lot of money into that province. Um, what happens to that economy remains to be seen. Uh, I think the impact will be serious in nature. Um, and also a lot of the excess labor from KP, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa ends up in um, uh, Karachi and, and works in the industries associated with Karachi's economy. And so what happens there it remains to be seen. I think the government has done a good job expanding the SAS program um, and, and the 12,000 rupees over four months uh, and, and giving it to, I think, about 60 million people in total, about 12 million households is good. I think they need to expand it. Um, from in negotiations with the IMF and what the IMF may demand, I think the government has to be bolder in its approach, uh, whether it's related to the fiscal deficit or elsewhere, um, to give more money to people. Because this crisis is different in, in, in compared to past crises. And the reason for that is that when the IMF has stepped in previously or Pakistan's economy has slowed down, the informal economy continues to grow. Um, in this instance, because of the lockdown, that's not happening. 
And so you need cash in the informal sector and a stimulus in the informal sector to keep the marginalized communities afloat, uh, to keep the lower middle class uh, from going hungry. Um, and I think that's the real challenge for this government, which is why they keep going back to opening up the economy and the debate around that, which I think is flawed in, in the sense that, you know, if, you're emp if you have empathy for the poor uh, and you want them to have a decent living, and I'll conclude with this, um, is that the rich will stay at home and protect themselves with PPE or whatever measures they can take to keep themselves healthy. The poor person will go out to seek a living and they will be the ones infected. They will be the ones who will be in clusters um, dying by the tens of thousands if this continues. Um, so I think the government as the doctors have said in Sindh and Punjab and probably KP will be next, uh, must reconsider what it's thinking about and let the healthcare professionals who are on the front lines of this give advice and determine uh, when to open up the economy. Thanks so much, Azara. That's um, a, a very startling and, uh, you know, to talk about this as the most critical series of events since partition is something that we need to really uh, examine and think about in a long term way. I think your comments do. Uh, they echo what Prime Minister Khan said earlier this week that we have to save our people from poverty, from hunger. So we have a push and pull between the health concerns and the real economic and, um, uh, and living concerns of day-to-day -day people in Pakistan. With that, I'd, I'd like to turn to Cyril Almeida, who is a visiting senior expert here at USIP. He is a Pakistan journalist who's very well known. He uh, had a very famous column and was assistant editor at Dawn. He has written widely on a variety of issues, including national politics and civil relations. Cyril, I'd like to really ask you with this, uh, what, what Khurram talked about as a unraveling almost of this lockdown and the dire economic impact that, um, that Uzair talked about, what, what are you seeing as the, the political balance in this? What are the provinces doing? And you know, really what is the governance impact here? Hi, um, thanks to Mana. Um, just as this uh, ses session started, I saw a gentleman with a large, rather large hammer outside my window. So in case you hear some hanging, uh, forgive me. But um, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and pick up on what Khuram and uh, Zair talked about, and I'm going to try and first understand or sketch out the implications for the population of the state policy choices made so far. Um, then I'm going to move on to what you just mentioned, uh, sort of the foreseeable effects on politics in Pakistan of the coronavirus uh, epidemic, pandemic. And finally, I'm going to try and, by way of a couple of examples, talk about sort of the unexpected or perhaps the, uh, the range of implications in, in areas that you may not have thought of before uh, that this uh, virus may be creating. So starting with, um, you know, sort of building on what Khuram and Uzair talked about, um, I think it's fairly clear right now that Pakistan has taken a high risk strategy, which I would describe as unflattening the curve. Prime Minister Imran Khan is on TV right now, or was until a little while ago, talking expansively about how he envisages uh, the next month, the month of Ramzan that Khuram mentioned, um, what he expects of business and what he expects of society. And so essentially what you're seeing in Pakistan in this sort of is, will be an unflattening of the curve. And it's based on two things, which I think uh, need some sort of thought about. First of all, there will be minimal social distancing. The uh, debate may be about soft lockdown, hard lockdown, et cetera, but the capacity for Pakistan or for businesses or for society to maintain social distancing when shops are open, other than perhaps maybe large-scale exporters, the formal economy, maybe in some sections of that, you might be able to manage social distancing. But outside that, the semi-formal economy, the informal economy, once that opens up, uh, I think in many ways it's game over. Um, the other thing is, of course, testing. Uh, the other plank on which a strategy of uh, prevention can be based on right now, initial strategy. And uh, at the moment, Pakistan has a testing rate, daily testing rate of far below 10,000. I think it's about five or 6,000, it changes, uh, may have crept up a little bit today. And the stated aim of the government, the federal government is to get up to 25,000 uh, tests a day by the end of the month, but that seems ambitious. So if you think about it with a population of 225 million, if the aim is to get up to 25K tests a day, 
And then at the same time, you have this sort of, uh, you know, opening up of the economy, which will inevitably min mean minimal social distancing. I think it's important to think through uh, what will at that point be the response of the population itself. Uh, Prime Minister Khan was on TV just a little while ago, and he mentioned that by next month, they expect that perhaps there will be up to 50K, 50,000 infections in Pakistan. But moving forward from that, if you think about what happens when there's 100K, what happens when there's 250K, what are the worst case and best case scenarios? I think, um, you know, obviously the best case scenario which the prime minister and people in his circle seem to be hoping for is that uh, the population will be able to take both sickness and death, if not in its stride, but that they will be able to maintain a level of economic activity and social life which will allow for Pakistan to sort of limp through the next few months. But if the worst case scenario comes through, and I think at this point, it's important to point out that anecdotal evidence, at least so far, suggests that maybe the death rate isn't as high as was feared. Perhaps it could just be that they are not cataloging or documenting the deaths. Uh, people aren't going to hospitals, they're afraid. Um, but if the you sort of best case scenario, or sort of rather worst case scenario comes through, but there's a spike in deaths. Uh, what will be the effect of the on the population itself? Anecdotal evidence again suggests that there is there is some genuine concern and a level of fear in the population. Nobody wants to get corona. So what happens if it starts spiking and people are falling sick in neighborhoods, etc.? I think um, you know, sort of, so far the focus has been largely on the state and the health sector and the responses. We need to start thinking a little bit through to uh, on what the population itself, how it will respond to these uh, strategies or tactics that the government is deploying. Um, the other thing, I mean, switching to politics, there's always politics in Pakistan. I think uh, the script of the first 18 months is out. Uh, in in an almost remarkable way, Prime Minister Khan has got an opportunity to reset and start again, almost a third of the way through his term. And at this moment, I'd say, at least it looks to me, that uh, Prime Minister Khan, Imran Khan, is strategically well positioned. He started out by talking about protecting the poor. Uh, so in a country which is poor and where there is uh, poverty, and particularly over the last 18 months with the economic slowdown, um, his, his political rhetoric at least probably aligns him on the right side of public opinion. On top of that, you have essentially austerities out. Uh, spending is going to be up. Budget deficits won't matter, the <coughs> debt rescheduling, et cetera. There's a lot of space that has opened up suddenly for this government to spend, to uh, give handouts to big business, et cetera. So many of the interest groups that the government may have alienated in its first 18 odd months will at this moment perhaps be like, okay, yeah, these are the guys to go with. Of course, nothing lasts forever in Pakistan with politics. And I, I think the opposition will look to attack on the COVID, uh, if there is a COVID spike, spike in COVID infections. The next opportunity that comes up for the opposition is of course the budget session, uh, upcoming budget session. It could be rowdy, it could be noisy. At this point, I'd like to uh, make a point, maybe uh, a point worth considering. Um, Prime Minister Khan might be one of the most fit or physically fit uh, leaders in the world, but the rest of the Pakistani leadership is not quite. And you have to think about, they're talking about a uh, budget session where everyone is in parliament, et cetera, whether uh, Corona could strike at the heart of the political leadership or the opposition in the country and what that could mean going forward. So my guess is going forward on politics, um, if Corona spikes, if the death count or the, I think more importantly, the infection and the hospitalization rates go up, you'll see uh, all, all political parties getting in, uh, throwing uh, accusations back and forth, because that's just, you know, sort of that deflects scrutiny and deflects accountability. And so unfortunately, my, my guess is going forward, we're going to see a lot more, the politics in the country will be noisier than it has been for a while, if that's possible. Um, and finally, I think I'm just going to try and by way of a couple of examples, tease out some of maybe the things that bear ought to be kept in mind about how Corona impacts areas that at first you may not have thought of. And so, for example, Kuram just mentioned um, the religious right in Pakistan, putting pressure on the government, putting pressure on the state and saying, okay, we have to keep mosques open, right? At some point going down in the next six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, et cetera, 
um, there are militant groups in Pakistan that who have been muzzled of late uh, because of pressure from the U.S. by the U.S. the FATF, Pakistan's own policies, etc. Um, those groups have welfare organization arms, uh, arms, the welfare arms. Are those groups going to say, "Hey, hang on a second, look, there's this"? A societal crisis. There's a economic crisis. We need to feed people. We need to uh, look after people, etc. You got to let us operate again, etc. So, will that kind of pressure start to build on the state again, and the consequences that could have uh, for sort of Pakistan's international position? As a little bit, I think uh, Elizabeth will talk a little more about that. And the other thing, of course, is something closer to my heart: uh, the issue of the media in Pakistan. Um, you've seen already uh, the arrest of uh, a business, uh, a media owner, uh, Mir Shakil Rahman, owner of the biggest uh, media group in Pakistan on specious charges. Um, that, of course, you've seen in other parts of the world, you know, sort of authoritarian tendencies coming in. Um, but I think for the media, there's also this uh, problem coming, and it's right there already, which is that the business model itself may be collapsing or on the verge of collapsing. Uh, in Pakistan, the uh, media depends on advertising, uh, and some of the newer houses that have come into this uh, business uh, depend on uh, funding from their other businesses. So with the economy at a standstill or slowing or contracting, I think you're going to look uh, forward or you're going to expect the media in Pakistan that is under even more pressure, not just by the state, but by a failing business model. Uh, that's, that's, those are my thoughts, Kamanda. Thanks so much, Cyril. That was uh, very interesting. Um, I'd like to shift now to thinking about all of these, both the economic crisis and the real health crisis that Pakistan's facing. It's um, most commentators would say that such a large scale outbreak and economic crisis, um, Pakistan's capacity to weather this without international assistance is limited. And so I want to talk about sort of the international um, assistance and the international impact in terms of Pakistan's foreign policy, et cetera. So I want to turn to Elizabeth to talk about a little bit of the, so what, what does this all mean for us here in Washington, but also, um, you know, in terms of India-Pakistan relations, in terms of Pakistan-Afghanistan relations, please, Elizabeth. Um, just to know, Elizabeth is a senior fellow and deputy director of the South Asia program at the Stimson Center. And before joining Stimson, she was a foreign service officer in uh, at the State Department and has served in Islamabad and in Peshawar. Thank you, Elizabeth. Great, thanks so much, Tamana. Um, really appreciate the comments of my fellow panelists as well. And I'll try to kind of zoom out a little bit um, and run through the view from DC as I see it um, on how the coronavirus has impact both US interests in Pakistan, but the broader bilateral relationship um, and what policymakers here in DC will likely be focusing on in the weeks and months ahead. Um, so as I see it, the challenge going forward will be to first help manage the immediate impact of, of COVID-19 in Pakistan, while second, also trying to maintain the positive momentum we've seen in the relationship over the past year or so. Um, these issues were among those that were highlighted in the readout of yesterday's phone call between President Trump and Prime Minister Imran Khan. Um, and I think will be relevant, not just in the near term, but over the, the, the coming months as well. Um, so on that first point, in terms of managing the immediate impact of the coronavirus, uh, we've heard from others today about just how the situation is looking in Pakistan. Um, there was a 40% spike in cases over the past five days. Um, and so things are, are looking increasingly dire, unfortunately. Um, and what that means in the terms of the bilateral relationship, um, the fact that coronavirus is a pandemic raises unique challenges that complicate relief efforts. So in the past, the US has been out in front in providing assistance to Pakistan, for example, after the 2005 earthquake or the, the 2010 flooding, but simply by virtue of the fact that we are facing our own um, massive outbreak and, and confronting supply shortages, that constrains U.S. capacity. The U.S. Is, is simply less able to provide the sort of assistance that um, it has in the past uh, to Pakistan when it's faced future or, uh, or past disasters. But simultaneously, because it is a pandemic and it has the potential to and spread and affect all of us around the globe, um, it is all the more important to contain the spread of the, of the disease. Um, and I think it drives the point home that 
the weakest links among, among us make us all vulnerable. Um, and so that speaks to the need to provide that outreach and seek ways of providing assistance um, because it is both in the US interest and, and more broadly in, in global interest, in addition to obviously being in, in Pakistan's own interest and that of its people. So one way of doing that that we've heard a lot about recently that Uzera touched on is through this question of debt relief. Um, so we saw the last week's IMF approval of the $1.4 billion zero interest loan to Pakistan. Um, Pakistan altogether has, has gotten about 2 billion um, in loans to tackle the immediate crisis. There's also an expectation that Pakistan will request about 1.8 million um, in payment deferment from G20 countries. So that will start to, to help um, with the immediate challenge. But I think one question in terms of the broader bilateral relationship that I would imagine US policymakers will be thinking through um, is how to ensure that debt relief is used for its intended purposes um, and doesn't indirectly go towards um, China funded projects. So this, um, the CPEC debt load, for example. So the existing IMF program had careful firewalls that were in place to prevent that from happening, um, but it's likely to be much more difficult to ensure that um, and demonstrate that with this sort of emergency relief. So I think that's one thing to keep in mind in terms of um, a future hurdles that could present themselves down the road. I think in terms of what the US and Pakistan um, can do because we are simultaneously going through this here in the States, um, sharing best practices and, and some sort of governance innovations that might come out of this. So we're facing similar challenges. Um, I think Kurum put it well in his column this morning, it's how do you balance life and livelihoods? Um, so public health with the economy, with jobs, uh, with freedom of religion and with politics. So we've seen thus far here in the States, um, there's been a rise of virtual learning um, of virtual worship services, of doctor's visits that are conducted by phone or um, through Zoom and, and other platforms. Obviously there are constraints in terms of bandwidth and capacity and access in Pakistan, but that could be one area where the US is positioned to share best practices. Um, I think also uh, to the point that Cyril was making in terms of how this works for legislators, the idea of remote voting um, and remote legislating and how um, our systems of government can continue to function. Obviously this is an election year in the US and we've seen some challenges in Wisconsin and elsewhere with voting um, and indeed in Congress too. So if there are ways that we can share best practices and information, I think there's a lot of room for that. And indeed, not just from the US to Pakistan, but from Pakistan to the US, if there are things that um, either side is doing particularly well, not just at the national level, but also at the provincial um, and even local level too. And then of course, just scientific and, and government um, expertise and public health experts can provide information because the US is a little bit further along in our outbreak um, in terms of numbers, in terms of how best to control the spread. I think that's gonna be key. Uh, and then in terms of that second basket that I mentioned, so how to maintain positive momentum in the relationship going forward, I think three things in particular come to mind, some of which have already been mentioned. Um, so first is how to facilitate um, continued progress in the Afghan peace process. So this was mentioned prominently in the Trump Han call yesterday. Um, obviously, Pakistan has done quite a bit to um, facilitate those talks to, to put pressure on the Taliban to participate. I think the next step is to find ways of moving towards intra-Afghan negotiation amidst um, the challenges of the COVID pandemic. Um, so two things that come to mind immediately are uh, the push for a broader ceasefire um, between the Taliban and Afghan security forces, particularly with the spring offensive likely to um, begin soon. So to the extent that Pakistan is, is able and willing to provide that assistance and continue to put pressure on the Taliban um, to come to the table to participate in talks and to prioritize public health um, in this emergency moment, that will go a long way um, in continuing to maintain momentum in, in the bilateral relationship. I think also um, prevention of a crisis between India and Pakistan along the LOC, the line of control, um, and Fortunately, we've seen that firing incidents have increased recently. There's also rumors of increased infiltration across the line of control um, and 
a greater security force presence as the weather warms um, in Kashmir. And so I would argue the last thing that, that Pakistan, India, the United States needs right now is a crisis on the subcontinent. Um, and so simply by virtue of the fact that there is, there's too much else going on, um, finding ways of containing that potential um, so that we don't find ourselves simultaneously in a moment of crisis management uh, will be very important uh, to tamp down firing along the LOC. And then lastly, I would just say to ensure continued progress on counterterrorism objectives. Um, so we did see that the Financial Action Task Force extended the deadline um, for its next review from April 30th to October 30th, which will give a little bit of extra time. Um, but those same challenges that uh, Pakistan is facing in terms of its demonstrating its compliance to avoid blacklisting will continue across that time. Um, and as, as Cyril alluded to, there have been a few concerning developments that I would highlight recently. So we saw the report that um, around half or 3,600 names had been removed from the NACTA prescribed persons list. Um, that was explained as, as being part of cleaning up that data, removing um, duplications. But I think it is concerning to the extent that that, that might be speaking to some backsliding um, in terms of, of CT compliance. Um, likewise, the acquittal of the murder suspects of Daniel Pearl by the Send High Court earlier this month um, was concerning. It's now been appealed to the Supreme Court, which is a positive development, but that's certainly a case that the US will be watching. And then as Cyril mentioned lastly, just the potential for groups that are linked to prescribed organizations like Jamaat al-Dawa, for example, or Fala Insan Yat Foundation, those are groups that could find a space, um, find an opening through the COVID pan, uh, pandemic to provide the relief and, and attract funding. Um, and so finding ways of providing public health services while ensuring that those groups that are linked to militant organizations do not find ways of benefits, uh, benefiting from the crisis will be very important. Um, so I hope that's helpful in just kind of outlining some of the steps that I think might go towards maintaining the, the momentum of the relationship while also um, responding to the immediate crisis. Um, I think the challenge is going to be doing both simultaneously, but if, if we're able to, both the US and Pakistan, um, these are ways of ensuring that once this immediate crisis is passed, uh, we'll be able to pick up where we left off effectively um, and build on that previous momentum that we've seen in the relationship. Thanks. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. That was very useful. Um, now we're going to open up the floor to questions. Um, please, uh, if you have questions in the audience, feel free to put them on YouTube um, in the comment section and our moderators, we will get the questions to the panelists. I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair to ask an opening question. Um, Kuram, for you, you mentioned, you know, the various responses a little bit. I, I want to get a sense of how the different provinces are actually reacting. I mean, we've seen a lot in terms of Karachi doing a, a good job with the Chief Minister of Sindh, um, getting a lot of attention for preventing what could have been a worse crisis in Pakistan's largest city and its economic hub. But how are the other, you know, Sindh and we've heard KP, uh, good stories out of KP as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about the push and pull between center and provinces and the different provincial responses? Sindh and the center. Uh, the reason for that is that the other two provinces, the Sindh is the only province that is uh, ruled by an opposition party. Uh, so there's going to be some amount of built-in tension in that relationship to start off with. Uh, but on the other hand, but because Sindh has placed uh, the entire crisis first and for framed it first and foremost as a public health emergency, and they say this in their, in, in their own meetings. I met with the, the chief minister Sindh only a few days ago on, back on Sunday. Uh, and he was very clear on this, and this is first and foremost a public health emergency. And the one thing that he lamented more than anything else through all this when he was asked was the absence of a national narrative framing it as a public health emergency. And he said that I'm not getting the kind of support that I would like to see from the center um, because uh, uh, they want to see this whole uh, affair through other lenses other than a public health emergency. Now in Punjab and KP, what we've seen happen is initially, the province of Punjab floundered for a response, uh, but leadership eventually emerged from within the folds of the Punjab bureaucracy. Uh, a group of people were pulled together 
and uh, they did work, uh, they did put together some amount of they did do some amount of work in how to uh, implement lockdown how to sharpen uh, the focus but in the meantime uh, what we saw happen in punjab was that the testing regime went all over the place uh, so if pakistan has conducted something like 120000 uh, tests uh, thus far uh, give or take uh, but it's about that much Uh, more than half of those just about more than half uh, slightly above half of those have been done in punjab and uh, so of the 60000 plus tests that uh, cumulatively that punjab has done again more than half of all of those have been done privately have uh, have been done in an untargeted manner Me- meaning you just come up you pay and you get a test done uh, versus uh, testing being done in the context of uh, world health organization guidelines Uh, such as, for instance, as part of a contact tracing effort, such as uh, uh, testing those who have a, a travel history to uh, countries that are that are in the midst of an outbreak, or testing those who have uh, advanced symptoms um, of COVID. Uh, so, less than half of uh, the testing done by Punjab has been uh, targeted, has been what we might call smart testing, and. Um, KP has uh, um, produced uh, again leadership emerged in KP in the form of the Minister Health over there, the Provincial Minister Health, uh, Temur Jagra, who's also the Minister of Finance, um, and uh, uh, he found support from among his own cabinet colleagues, uh, and they have experimented and they've tried a slightly different model uh, for a lockdown. Uh, again, uh, sharply focusing their testing specific, you know, by following guidelines uh, very closely. and providing a more sort of a local government based response um over there you see the results when you look at the number of tests done and the number of positive cases found so in that uh, the national average is about 10% uh 10% of all tests uh, to have uh, found a positive case um the idea behind smart testing is that the more you focus your testing the higher that percentage should be the higher it is the better because that means you are actually finding the people who uh, are most likely to be positive cases and that uh, and using your scarce testing resources on those people uh to uh, to 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 confirm um so kp has a 13 percentage a 13% uh, return on um, on on its uh, number of tests done punjab was the lowest um of course which means that their testing is going all over the place it's more a shotgun approach to uh, to to testing um and that i think feeds into a little bit of a leadership vacuum that punjab has been struggling with uh through through all this uh balochistan found itself in the bit of a spotlight because the first in the initial spurt of cases that came came through the province of balochistan uh these were the returnees coming from iran from pilgrimage uh over 6000 of them were interned or quarantined in balochistan province and um, that's where the first uh, uh, and largest case of uh, infections was discovered uh, of course the, they they're known as the zairin the returnees uh, who are coming back from ziarat from pilgrimage uh, to to holy sites in iran um, and in that the balochistan government's own defense was that uh, they were supposed to manage the quarantine but the federal government was supposed to provide the testing backup uh, mm-hmm. and whereas the quarantine was uh, implemented the testing uh, facilities never began until it was very late so there was again a central province uh, issue that that played up over there and uh, the next largest spurt of cases came from uh, punjab uh the the raivin uh, the the tablighi jamaat the religious congregation in uh, in raivin province uh, half of all the cases that have tested positive in the city of lahore for example uh, half of them are uh, tablighi jamaat people so the the jamaat turned into a major major node for the spread of uh, the infection and now they're being uh, they they're testing positive all over the country and in, in different locations uh, i haven't seen today yeah sorry of the man No, thank you, Karam. Um, I'm. I just want to. Um, we'll come back to you. I want to get uh, Uzair may actually have to fall off our um, webcast here, so I want to quickly get you a question. We have a couple questions. One on the uh, Chinese debt and how you see that going forward. What's going to happen there, Uzair? And second, in terms of the expansion of the SAS program, I mean, it's a lot of money. Austerity measures are gone. Will there be any transparency? Any? Uh, accountability on all of the money that the government is spending. Yeah so on Chinese debt I think uh, important to put into perspective that when the IMF data came out uh, when Pakistan entered the IMF program was that if you add up sovereign debt 
um, owned by China as well as commercial bank debt owned by China. It comes to about a quarter of Pakistan's total external debt. If you add in what is owed to uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, one could argue, give or take, uh, it's about a third of total external debt. So when you look at the G20 and debt restructuring, China in particular will have to take a lead in, in, in taking and bearing the burden of that along with the Paris Club countries. Um, and I think that will be a different set of circumstances compared to what we saw in 2001 following 9-11 when restructuring happened with the Paris Club. Um, and so I think there, I don't foresee personally uh, uh, any scenario where the Chinese will play hard to hardball with the Pakistanis, given everything that is at stake, both between the strategic relationship in terms of the strategic relationship, but also what at stake uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative and what China is trying to do in the wake of this pandemic to take a more leadership approach uh, into global affairs. Um, so I think the Chinese will play a key role in the G20 level and they will bear the burden of rescheduling and restructuring Pakistani debt, both sovereign and commercial bank. Um, on the Assas thing, I think, look, it was called the Benazir Income Support Program. That's what uh, the People's Party put it together, long known for corruption. Um, but it is one of the most effective cash transfer programs in South Asia, um, maybe in the world, if one could look at the data. Um, and the testament to its success is that the PMLN, when it came into power, expanded it. The P PTI, when it came to power, rebranded it, but expanded it. And Sanya Nishtha is a very credible person who's running this program. And they are indicating that they will uh, develop or, I think, release data uh, on a portal that showcases the transactions that are occurring. At the same time, I would say that, look, at any point in time when stimulus like this is unveiled, even in the United States, we saw Harvard getting funds that it shouldn't have. Um, right. So even in a country like Pakistan, there will be leakages. We should be OK with that, because at this point in time, the goal is to get money to those who need it at a rapid pace. And if that means that 5 percent, 10 percent of the funds to go to people who are undeserving, I think that's fine. Look, the problem in Pakistan is that someone who's poor has to go through five filters or six filters before they get the 12,000 rupees for four months. While you're an indus industrialist or a, or a crony capitalist, you get to meet the prime minister and get what you want the next day. Look at the construction package, right? Um, so I think we should be okay with that. Um, as long as there's transparency, that's fine. And that's what they're indicating. And even if in transparency, we find leakages, um, the crisis is such that some sort of leakages should be tolerated and should be okay for the time being. Thanks so much, Azair. Um, we are getting a lot of questions and thank you all for putting them in, but continue to add your questions on YouTube. Um, as Khurram alluded to about both the Zairin who came back from Iran and then the Tablighi Jamaat in Punjab at Raiwind, um, I want to talk a little bit about this sort of sectarian nature and the reaction to uh, religious gatherings that we've seen in Pakistan. And for that, I, I want to turn to Cyril if you can uh, one of the questions we saw online is if you can talk about the sectarian nature um, of uh, the response and of accusations, maybe uh, you know people are reacting negatively at, uh, to minorities, et cetera. So Cyril, I'd like to turn to you for that. Sure. Um, I think as Kura mentioned, um, when the start in the, the first mass outbreak in Pakistan was linked to the Pakistan-Iran border. Um, and of course, the sh returning Shia pilgrims from there. And I think in the Pakistani media, online particularly, there was a bit of a backlash. You could see people criticizing them that, oh, of course, yes, this is a Shia thing. But then once it turned to the Tablighi Jamaat and the Tablighi Jamaat uh, being a Sunni organization, um, they turned into super spreaders. I think some of that sort of fell away. And I think in the initial stages, at least when it was new, it was novel, people were still trying to understand what this was and there was fear. Um, they were pinning it on particular communities. But I, my guess is, and it's a guess at this point, as it washes through and it courses through Pakistan, through all communities, rich, poor, through all ethnicities, through all sects, et cetera, you, you might see a diminishing of that. Where you might see an increase in competition or tension is when there are scarce resources. I think, again, going back to the Prime Minister speaking just before the show, he's been quite adamant and clear. And I think in that way, you've got to give him credit for being transparent. But there's only so much money Pakistan has. There's only so much it can do, or there's only so much his government can do. In that case, uh, going forward, if there is a spike, if there's a growing crisis in the country, uh, competition over resources, et cetera, could see um, a sort of re-emergence of sectarian tensions. And of course, finally, um, I think what Elizabeth mentioned too, of course, there are groups in Pakistan and have existed before 
uh, with an overt sectarian nature. Uh, Pakistan is no stranger to violence and sectarian violence. So going forward, um, you could see that. But at this stage, I think uh, the initial outrage and outburst over the returning Shia pilgrims is so, somewhat dissipated. And now it's, it seems to be a, a fear of all Pakistanis as opposed to just a particular group spreading it within the country. Thanks, Errol. That's very, uh, very useful. Elizabeth, I want to turn to you. We're getting several questions about Kashmir and also about the LOC. Can you comment a little bit about how the rate of reported or rumored incidents this year along the LOC compares to previous years and anything further in terms of the impact in Kashmir and between India and Pakistan on this? Uh, and what do you see as we go forward? I mean, Kashmir has, uh, on the Indian side, has been in lockdown since August. Um, how has this impacted that? Sure, happy to. Um, so in terms of absolute data, um, it's obviously hard to, to get firm numbers on this. What I have seen is that the, the current numbers we're seeing now are certainly the highest that have been in a year, I think two years as well. Um, so that dates back to before the Pulwama Balakot incident um, of March, 2019. Um, and that's significant simply because um, there is always a risk that that conflict, those firing incidents along the Yellow Sea could themselves escalate, um, or that they're an indication of broader tensions in the bilateral India-Pakistan relationship. I think that's especially worrisome um, because what we're seeing right now in um, Indian administered Kashmir, as you alluded to, is um, the snow is starting to melt. Uh, we're coming to the spring and I think analysts have been concerned for a while about what that could look like in Kashmir after months and months of lockdown um, and following the August 5th decision to um, repeal Article 370 and 35A of the Indian Constitution, which had granted Kashmir um, limited autonomy. And so to the extent that um, the cumulative effect of that lockdown and frustration um, over that decision could now express itself a little bit more clearly now that the winter is over, the snow has melted. Um, there's a potential for um, an uptick in violent incidents in Kashmir. And as, as I alluded to in my comments, um, given the already strained capacity, not just of Pakistan, but India as well, um, which is facing its own significant coronavirus outbreak, um, that sort of domestic instability that could spark an international crisis would be especially troubling and concerning at this time when the U.S., um, which has traditionally played a role of um, facilitating crisis management in the region, is likewise distracted um, from the coronavirus epidemic. And so um, that's all to say that it's worth watching um, those sorts of incidents along the LOC um, and for both sides to continue to ensure that they only have one crisis at a time to handle. Thanks very much, Elizabeth. That's very useful. Uh, let's turn, we're getting us several questions about civil military balance, and I'm going to ask both Khuram and Cyril to comment. You know, the coronavirus crisis has really formalized the military's role and further formalized uh, military's role in national policy making. We see NCC, NCOC, they're already playing a lead role in supporting the National Disaster Management Authority. So is the military prepared? What are ways that they can be constructive in uh, addressing this crisis? And then what is the impact actually on the government, the civilian government and on the civil mill balance? So I'd ask uh, Khuram and then Cyril to comment. Um, the civil mill balance has been, uh, it, it, it's, it, it's undergone some complex recalibration through, uh, through all of this. Uh, there are moments when we have seen very tight coordination and uh, uh, you know the, the two of these authorities working together in ways that we've uh, not seen in the past or at least we haven't seen in a long time uh, in the past working together to solve problems um, and there have been times when we've seen the two of them sort of uh, talking past each other or at least uh, uh, sending out mixed messages let me give you an example of the latter uh, a few weeks back, uh, the Prime Minister on one Saturday gave a public address in which he listed all of the disadvantages of a lockdown 
and uh, talked about how it's simply not possible for a country like Pakistan to undertake uh, the kind of a lockdown that many other advanced industrial countries are taking, that people are talking about. The entire televised address was understood by people as um, his reason why uh, the lockdown uh, far from being tightened should in fact be loosened, uh, loosened and in fact done away with altogether. The very next day, we had the military come on the air and pretty much announce a lockdown uh, nationwide. And uh, the, the uh, DGISPR was on the air saying, and he, his words were that this is the most serious crisis Pakistan has faced. Uh, and uh, uh, he himself announced a ban on, on all intercity movement uh, and, and, and what not a far reaching series of uh, um, restrictions that basically amounted to a nationwide lockdown. And this happened the very next day. Uh, this was obviously, this is one of the moments when the, the, the differing approaches between the military and the civilian authorities um, sort of, you know, uh, came out in full public view. And, uh, and we saw that the military was in favor of uh, proceeding uh, as if this is a public health emergency and treating it as such. Um, of course, they were also extremely concerned about the spread of the disease among their own ranks and uh, among the soldiers, especially those uh, in deployments in the Western and the Eastern borders. Um, that could be an extremely difficult situation for them. They were mindful of this. Um, we've seen the, the civil and military authorities work very closely uh, together. And another example of that, uh, there are many, I'll just give you one, um, is the building of the field hospital in Karachi uh, at the Expo Center, which was a, a provincial government initiative to build um, a thousand bed facility in uh, the city of Karachi, convert the Expo Center into a thousand bed uh, facility. And they reached out to the, the uh, Corps Commander Karachi uh, to uh, have the, the medical corps uh, help them build uh, it as a field hospital. And the military came and built it basically. It was funded by, and uh, the, the premises were arranged by the, the provincial government and the facility was built by the military. Um, over there and it's now uh, functioning, it's operating. As per my last count, 162 uh, patients uh, uh, are housed over there uh, under isolation. So we've seen both happening uh, over here, but of late, uh, we've been hearing less and less from the military, uh, which means there's no public pronouncements except at a very general level. Um, to, to simply state, like the core commanders meeting recently simply said that the military will continue supporting the civilian authorities. Uh, but we've seen less and less of the sort of, uh, uh, you know, the military directly intervening in or, uh, or taking charge, uh, of, uh, at least in a public way. But at the National Command and uh, Control Authority, uh, the, the military is there, it's headed by a general. The, the NDMA, uh, the National Disaster Management Authority, that's doing a lot of the procurement of the testing kits and the personal protection equipment for hospital staff, is headed by a serving general. Uh, the National Institute of Health, uh, that's uh, uh, running the COVID dashboard, that's uh, uh, running the testing facilities, um, is also headed by a, uh, by a, by a general. Um, so there is significant amount of military uh, input into the coordination of uh, the overall response on the health side of this. Great, thanks, Karam. Um, Cyril, uh, anything you'd like to add? Are, I mean, are, and my question here to be add would be, are there red lines or further down the road if, if lockdown unravels and, you know, things get worse, where do you, you know, where do you think the military would step in? Well, no, the gentleman with the large hammer is back. Um, you know, I mean, this, it's a tricky area. Well, it's, a, it's an opaque uh, area too, so it's hard to guess from the outside, but um, you know, you can make a few educated guesses. I think at the moment, as things stand, it seems pretty apparent that uh, Prime Minister Khan has become more assertive in recent days and the military has deferred to his initial approach of, look, this is what we can do. Let's be realistic of what we can do. So as the initial panic perhaps has, has subsided and there's a more measured response to it, I, I think to a large extent, uh, they're uh, squaring the circle around largely what Imran Khan has wanted. Um, going forward, of course, that's the X factor. I think uh, what everyone's watching, if social unrest spikes, if Corona spikes, if there is, um, you know, uh, large scale protests in the country. Um, some of that has been mitigated by the very fact that the Prime Minister is opposed to lockdowns. And the most obvious way for protests to spike would have been if the lockdowns were forced and were severe and the military was drawn in to uh, impose a curfew, for example. So I, I think we're not 
close to the stage, I would say, um, you know, maybe uh, counterintuitively, uh, Imran Khan right now is in a stronger position than he was even a few weeks ago. Um, you saw the sharpening of the political rhetoric between the PP and PTI. Once again, I'm sure in certain power centers made people think, hang on, you know, maybe Imran Khan is not being as sensible as we would like him to, but what's the alternative, right? We can't go back to the PPP, we can't go to the PMLN, can't change course midship. And of course, behind that would be the, I'm sure the calculation that if you replace or try and, you know, sort of swap out leaders, the question would be like, oh, well, what about you, the person who made the choice initially? So uh, at, at this moment, I think, you know, uh, we have to keep watching. I, I think through Ramzan, et cetera, I would, it looks to me from afar, at least that Imran Khan is in a more secure position than he has been in, in quite some time. And for now, the military is happy to work in a role of facilitating uh, the governments rather than sort of taking over the process. Of course, uh, you know, this is Pakistan. And when you have a room full of generals, uh, the civilians will inevitably sort of uh, recede. Um, so let's see how that goes. Thanks, Cyril. Elizabeth, I want to turn to you. We're getting some questions about uh, Pakistan's relationship with China. How do you see it evolving in the future, um, given that you know there's been an overall lack of international coordination among countries? You mentioned the US is largely constrained, um, but is it mitigated by maybe the public perception or that the virus came from China? It's a complicated time for China as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, it's a good question and one that's worth watching over the coming months. Um, as I've seen it from, from here in DC, it seemed to have evolved um, quite a bit over the past couple of months. So initially when reports of the virus spread, um, there was the controversy over whether or not Pakistan would repatriate its students who are based in Wuhan. Um, there was quite a bit of, of criticism there leveled, I think largely at the, the Pakistan government, but in general, just an awareness of the fact that this China did or this virus did um, originate in China. Um, since then, though, what we've seen as the virus has spread, uh, the US itself has struggled with the response, um, at least publicly, there seems to be um, a little bit of a return to this narrative of China as the state that was able to combat the pandemic, the pandemic that it took the, the right response, um, and that China as the all-weather friend of Pakistan will be there to share those best practices and help Pakistan through um, the coronavirus as well. Um, there's been public rhetoric along those lines. Um, we saw some key visits by Pakistani leaders to, to China, just kind of trying to reemphasize the importance of that relationship in the midst of this pandemic. I think what's interesting to me though, is I've heard from, from friends and contacts in Pakistan a little bit more privately that some doubts are starting to emerge about the way that China did handle the crisis. Um, and leading me to think that there might be a little bit of um, a challenge in terms of trust in the relationship. So questions, for example, over whether China minimized the, the casualty count of COVID and was not um, reporting the correct numbers, which in turn led other countries to face greater challenges as they were preparing for its response and its impacts. Um, so doubts over the, the figures that were coming out of China um, both about its ability to contain the virus itself and then just more broadly about what that says that uh, it wasn't communicating the, the real data. And then also there's been concerns over um, the effectiveness of some of the test kits that have come out of China. Um, some reports in the media um, from Pakistan, but also more broadly uh, that those are less effective than they were initially reported, that there've been fake test kits um, those sorts of issues as well. Um, and so I think going forward, uh, Pakistan is likely to rely pretty heavily on China um, in its own response and, and relief efforts. And so I don't see any sort of broad change in the relationship in that respect, but I think watching the extent to which there might be a growing trust deficit between the two sides in terms of, of how trustworthy the, the Chinese data and then those Chinese relief supplies are, uh, is something to watch going forward. Thank you. Um, Khurram, uh, we have a very interesting question. You know, Elizabeth actually alluded to in her opening comments about how things are changing here with telework and other things. But the question is, is how should Pakistani businesses adapt to the current fast changing environment? And what are you seeing, you know, is social distancing or other methods, tele, you know, pr 
products, other things, what are they doing to actually adapt to and address the crisis? Yeah, that's very interesting uh, because we're seeing a, a, a massive increase in the use of all digital tools. Um, so including those that were always available, but were rarely used. Uh, so just the other day, in fact, I was speaking with, um, and we ran a story on this as well, uh, with uh, some people in the telecom industry, um, just asking, you know, what are they seeing in terms of the changing patterns of usage? Um, they said like video conferencing facilities of the sort that we are using right now um, uh, are, are, are driving a great deal of uh, mobile usage, uh, a lot of uh, consumption of bandwidth. Anyways, uh, you know, businesses can, I think, adapt by using digital tools to the, to the absolute maximum, first of all. Um, yeah, that cuts down significantly on their costs. Many businesses are right now in the process of learning that they don't even need formal offices anymore. I mean, I can tell you that our newspaper is in large measure right now being put out by people working from home. Um, and uh, when the whole thing does pass and it's safe to come back out and go back to offices, I think many businesses are going to find out that renting expensive office premises, keeping them maintained, investing in hardware to uh, uh, keep them equipped, uh, maybe a cost that you can save, um, you know, if, uh, because you can actually do all that from home. And uh, coupled with this, I think there is a, a, a massive opportunity right now to give a boost to mobile money and digital payments. Uh, I'm a bit uh, uh, perplexed as to why they've chosen not to use mobile money for the SRS program and its distribution, why they're insisting on doing that distribution through banks uh, and in cash, where people have to actually assemble at, uh, they're saying 17,000 locations around the country, which is actually very small if you think about the number of people uh, that are being served by the program. Um, and uh, you're seeing massive crowds forming outside these, uh, these, these centers. Um, I mean, if they give that same uh, contract or if they opened it up to mobile money uh, through the telecoms, you could have, uh, instead of 17, you could have easily 80, 90,000 uh, outlets uh, where people could uh, collect their cash or simply just continue transacting in, uh, in, in, in mobile money. But mobile payments have seen a very significant uptick uh, in the past, uh, yeah, since the lockdown began. And I think that's going to continue that trend and it's going to receive a big boost as well. I think making maximum use, whether for payments purposes, whether for communications uh, or any other, or for uh, any other kind of coordination uh, of the digital tools that are available to us, um, th this is a fantastic opportunity uh, to give all of that a big boost and you know, serve as a cost saving measure in many ways and a transformative measure in others. Thanks so much, Karam. Um, we will end with one last question. We're getting a lot of questions in terms of the impact on the Afghan peace process and on Pakistan's ability to actually um, work in the process to play a constructive role um, and the impact on the Taliban. So I would just ask um, Cyril and then Elizabeth to briefly comment on um, Afghanistan-Pakistan relations and the peace process. Sure, thanks, Amanda. Um, you know, when it comes to Afghanistan, I think in this terribleness, perhaps the only silver lining in all of this so far has been the timing of Corona could not have been better from a Pakistani state perspective. Imagine that the first phase of the Afghan deal had not been concluded at this point and the bickering was still going on and Pakistan said we needed to go back to the IMF, needed all this money, it needed its debt rescheduling, et cetera. So in terms of timing, um, I think Pakistan uh, in some ways, uh, I mean, obviously it's a pandemic, uh, but lucked out. And you can also see going forward, uh, perhaps here in the US, uh, you know, we're all looking at Twitter all the time, expecting that tweet or at any moment, announcing a pullout from Afghanistan, et cetera. So, I think so far, at least in these early stages, Pakistan may have, um, may now be in a more advantageous position than it was in terms of protecting its interests as articulated by the Pakistani state in Afghanistan that was even weeks ago. But Elizabeth, sure. All right. Um, I think in terms of how coronavirus is likely to impact progress going forward, um, you know, to Cyril's point, it is interesting timing because right now the ball is very much in the Afghan government's court um, in terms of resolving the political turmoil, uh, moving forward with inter-Afghan negotiations. Um, I think the coronavirus provides just about the best opening that we could have hoped for, um, for 
an announcement of a ceasefire for forward movement on prisoner releases. All of these things are going to be impacted by coronavirus in Afghanistan. And so to the extent that, that either side was looking for a way of kind of moving down from maximalist positions at the negotiating table and saying in the interest of public health, we are making this gesture. We have seen some limited progress in prisoner releases um, on both sides, which is significant. Uh, but I think it's also important bearing in mind um, the, the US perspective here. So we saw the, the Pompeo visit to Kabul, um, the threatened cut of $1 billion in assistance. Um, and just by virtue of the coronavirus response and the economic challenges we're facing here in the US uh, that I think Uzair mentioned, you know, this is something that is going to cut pretty strongly against uh, the funding that's available for um, Afghanistan as well, even though it's, it's orders of magnitude different, right? So we're talking trillions um, in the US and, and this is just a billion in Afghanistan, but nonetheless, I think in terms of how politically palatable it will be going forward to put um, a still a non insubstantial chunk of change towards um, a situation in Afghanistan that has kind of fallen out of the headlines here in the US, uh, that is just going to raise the potential um, for future continued funding for Afghanistan to be more difficult to come by going forward um, in a post coronavirus world. Um, and so to the extent that that, I think now more real possibility could put additional pressure on Afghan elites to resolve the political turmoil, to, to come to the table, even if it isn't actually a, a table that everybody's sitting around themselves, but you know, Skype calls and all the rest. Um, I think it's positive that we've already seen some um, virtual engagement between the two sides, but important going forward also to just think through the modalities of how potentially um, virtual intra-Afghan talks could uh, progress usefully because this is going to be new ground in, in peace processes and I think room for future research from USIP and others. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. And, and for those who are um, interested in the Afghan peace process, just to pitch, USIP did a great webinar on this yesterday on the state of play and you can find that archived on our website. With that, I'd like to thank everyone who joined in from home uh, for our webinar. Um, I wanna thank our great panelists and we hope to continue to hold these webinars on the current crisis and other conflicts across South Asia. So please um, come back and join us next month for more webinars and thank you again and stay safe.